In the year 1516, a man named Erasmus restored the true Greek text from Antioch to the people of Europe. Two men would make translations for their people from this text. Martin Luther in Germany and William Tyndale in England. Both men had to disobey the laws of the Roman Catholic Church to make their translations. The Bible that William Tyndale began would eventually become the greatest book in the history of the world. One evening, William Tyndale was having a discussion with a Catholic bishop on the authority of Scripture. The bishop said that he respected the word of the Pope more than the Bible. To this, William Tyndale replied, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow shall know more of the Scripture than thou dost. Tyndale's desire was to make the Bible available in English instead of the Latin Bibles used by the Catholic clergy to keep the people in bondage. In 1534 he translated the New Testament into English from the Greek text of Erasmus. In 1536 William Tyndale was executed by the Roman Catholic Church. His crime? Giving the people of England the Word of God in their own language. A tyrannical church like Rome could not have their authority undermined by an English Bible. William Tyndale had to be killed if the Pope wanted to remain in control of the people of England. William Tyndale's dying words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. He was then strangled and his body set on fire. In the year 1604, King James I of England authorized a translation of the Holy Bible into the English language. Fifty-four of Europe's greatest scholars were gathered together for this monumental task which would take seven years to complete. Men like Lancelot Andrews who could speak fifteen languages and wrote his own private devotional books in Greek. Henry Seville was Greek and mathematical tutor to Queen Elizabeth. John Overall was an expert on the early church fathers. These 54 men were separated into six groups, two at Cambridge, two at Westminster, and two at Oxford. The translators would use the Greek text of Stephens, which was an updated copy of the Erasmus text. This Greek text is known today as the Textus Receptus. Over the next seven years, these men would translate and design the greatest book of all time. Each book of the Bible had to pass 14 tests before it was accepted as scripture. The authorized version was completed in 1611. This great Bible is commonly known today as the King James Version. William Tyndale's dying prayer to God had been answered. English-speaking people all over the world finally had the Word of God in their own language. As opposition to the Catholic Church grew, the Pope became desperate for a solution to his Protestant problem. In 1534, a man named Ignatius Loyola founded a radical society of Catholics whose purpose was to fight against the Protestant reformers. On September 27, 1540, Pope Paul III formally established the Jesuits as an official Catholic organization. Part of the Jesuit extreme oath of induction says, I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity present, 
make and wage relentless war secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants and liberals as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth. From 1545 to 1564, the Council of Trent met and condemned the enemies of the Catholic Church. In the fourth session they stated, Furthermore, to check unbridled spirits, it decrees that no one relying on his own judgment shall, in matters of faith and morals pertaining to the edification of Christian doctrine, distorting the Holy Scriptures, in accordance with his own conceptions, presume to interpret them contrary to that sense which Holy Mother Church, to whom it belongs to judge of their true sense and interpretation. This council decrees and ordains that in the future the Holy Scriptures, especially the old Vulgate edition, be printed in the most correct manner possible, and that it shall not be lawful for anyone to print or to have printed any books whatsoever dealing with sacred doctrinal matters without the name of the author or in the future to sell them, or even to have them in possession, unless they first have been examined and approved by the ordinary, under penalty of anathema, and fine prescribed by the last council of the latter. In the 25th session, they condemned the writings of men like Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, Balthasar, Friedberg, Schwenkfield, and others like these. Whatever may be their name, title, or nature of their heresy, are absolutely forbidden. The books of other heretics, however, which deal professedly with religion, are absolutely condemned. Finally, all the faithful are commanded not to presume to read or possess any books contrary to the prescriptions of these rules or the prohibition of this list. And if anyone should read or possess books by heretics or writings by any other author condemned and prohibited by reason of heresy or suspicion of false teaching, he incurs immediately the sentence of excommunication. He, on the other hand, who reads or possesses books prohibited under another name shall, besides incurring the guilt of mortal sin, be severely punished according to the judgment of the bishops. In 1605, the Jesuits tried to assassinate King James and the members of Parliament. On the morning of November the 5th, Guy Fawkes was discovered guarding 36 barrels of gunpowder, which had been hidden under the floor where King James would be standing in a matter of hours. This plan is known today as the Gunpowder Plot. The conspirators were captured and executed. God protected King James and the translators of the authorized version. But the Jesuits had another plan. If the people of England wanted an English Bible, then the Jesuits would write one for them. The Reims New Testament was released in 1582, and the Dewey Old Testament was finished in 1610, exactly one year before the authorized version of 1611. Over the next 300 years, the authorized version would produce more spiritual fruit than any other book in world history. For nearly 300 years, the King James Version had been the Bible of choice for the Christian world. Its preaching led to the salvation of millions of souls. The Christian Church enjoyed peace and prosperity like never before. Missionaries were sent to almost every country and the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached all over the world. The Roman Catholic Church had lost control of the English-speaking world. In 1871, the Church of England decided that the King James Version should be revised. Two unsaved scholars would see to it that a completely new Bible would be created to replace the King James Version. Who were these two men? 
Fenton John Anthony Hort, and Brooke Foss Westcott. These two men would use two of the Roman Catholic Church's Greek manuscripts to design their new version. The first is known as Codex Vaticanus. The second is called Codex Sinaiticus and was found in the trash at a Catholic monastery by Constantine von Tischendorf. Their corrupt revised version was released in 1881. But what about the beliefs of Westcott and Hort? In 1896, a collection of Hort's letters were published by his son. On page 76 we read, The pure Romish view seems to be nearer and more likely to lead to the truth than the evangelical. On page 148, Hort writes about the ordinary confused evangelical notions. On page 400, Hort admits that the positive doctrines even of the evangelicals seem to me perverted rather than untrue. There are, I fear, still more serious differences between us on the subject of authority, and especially the authority of the Bible. On page 445, Hort says, I have a sort of craving that our text should be cast upon the world before we deal with matters likely to brand us with suspicion. I mean a text issued by men already known for what will undoubtedly be treated as dangerous heresy will have great difficulties in finding its way to regions which it might otherwise hope to reach, and whence it would not be easily banished by subsequent alarms. Hort shows his hatred for the true Greek text on page 211 where he states, I had no idea till the last few weeks of the importance of texts. Having read so little Greek Testament and dragged on with the villainous Textus Receptus. He also says, think of that vile Textus Receptus leaning entirely on late manuscripts. It is a blessing there are such early ones. In a letter to Westcott, Hort writes on page 430, Certainly nothing can be more unscriptural than the modern limiting of Christ bearing our sins and sufferings to his death, but indeed that is only one aspect of an almost universal heresy. On page 120, Hort declares, The fact is, I do not see how God's justice can be satisfied without every man suffering in his own person the full penalty for his sins. Hort clearly did not believe that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross was enough to pay for his sins. But what about Westcott? What did he believe? In 1903, Westcott's son Arthur published his father's letters in a book. On pages 228 through 229, Westcott told Hort what he thought of the Textus Receptus. I feel most keenly the disgrace of circulating what I feel to be falsified copies of Holy Scripture, and am most anxious to provide something to replace them. He went on to say of the Christians of his day, but pray think how utterly ignorant and prejudiced even well-informed men are on the text of the New Testament. On page 52 Westcott said, I never read an account of a miracle, but I seem instinctively to feel its improbability and discover some want of evidence in the account of it. In volume 2, page 49, Westcott gives his views on heaven. He writes, It saves us from the error of connecting the presence of Christ's glorified humanity with place. Heaven is a state and not a place. On page 394, Westcott states, if Tennyson's idea of heaven was true, that heaven is the ministry of soul to soul, we may reasonably hope by patient, resolute, faithful, united endeavor to find heaven about us here, the glory of our earthly life. Westcott shows his love for Roman Catholicism on page 81 when he writes, After leaving the monastery, we shaped our course to a little oratory which we discovered on the summit of a neighboring hill, and by a little scrambling we reached it. Fortunately, we found the door open. It is very small, with one kneeling place, and behind a screen was a paeta. 
the size of life, i.e. a virgin and dead Christ. The sculpture was painted, and such a group, in such a place, and at such a time was deeply impressive. I could not help thinking of the fallen grandeur of the Romish church, on her zeal even in error, on her earnestness and self-devotion, which we might, with nobler views and a purer end, strive to imitate. Had I been alone, I could have knelt there for hours. It truly is sad to think that an intelligent man like Westcott could not bring himself to believe in miracles or heaven. The Westcott and Hort were both involved in something far more sinister than textual criticism. In 1845 they joined the Hermes Club. In 1851 they formed the Ghostly Guild, which was followed by the Arenas Club in 1872. These clubs were involved in necromancy, or trying to make contact with dead spirits. Why would two men who claim to be saved have such an interest in the spirit world? Should a Christian really trust a text or a Bible which can be traced back to these two men? Westcott and Hort's corrupt Greek text and their theories of textual criticism would go on to produce over 200 new versions in the next 120 years. With millions of King James Bibles in print, it would be impossible to destroy all of them. So if you can't destroy the King James Bible, then why not replace it with hundreds of corrupted counterfeits? Since 1881, an average of one new Bible has been released every year. Is the English language really changing this much? Or is there a darker agenda behind these new versions? Who would stand to profit the most if the King James Version passed out of common use? On October the 11th of 1962, the first session of the Second Vatican Council met in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Over the next few years they plotted out the future of the Roman Catholic Church. In November of 1965, the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation was written. In chapter 6 and on page 112 we read, But since the word of God must be readily available at all times, the church with motherly concern sees to it that suitable and correct translations are made into various languages, especially from the original texts of the sacred books. If when the opportunity presents itself and the authorities of the church agree, these translations are made jointly with churches separated from us, they can then be used by all Christians. In 1989, one of the New International Version creators, whose name was Burton Goddard, would write the NIV story. He would describe the process that the NIV translators would use to create their new version. On page 96, Burton Goddard would reveal a shocking secret about the NIV. The magic of summers in Europe is indeed getting the job done. So the pattern continues. In 1976, the scene is the Collegio Mayor Monteleno, a residential unit of the University of Salamanca, fourth oldest university in Europe. An order of Catholic nuns operates the residence, and affectionate ties of Christian love soon bind the hearts of all together in a marvelous way. What is the University of Salamanca? It is one of the Roman Catholic Church's oldest universities. It is also one of the schools that trained Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. Here is a picture of a human skull that appears as a decoration on the outside of this university. And what about the frog on top of the skull? Read Revelation chapter 16 verses 13 through 14 for more information. On page 97, Burton Goddard goes on to say, The summers in Europe make it possible for a collegiate translation to be produced within a relatively short span of time. In the process, they enrich the lives of translators and their families in a remarkable way in areas of history, culture, and scenic beauty. But more, they provide a practical day-by-day -day ecumenical experience beyond compare. 
But what Greek text did the NIV translators use? Surely as professing Christians they would have used the time-honored Textus Receptus, which by this time was backed up by over 99% of the extant Greek manuscripts. On page 111 of the NIV, the making of a contemporary translation, we read, What is meant by New Testament? The so-called Textus Receptus, received text, is the Greek form of the New Testament that underlies the KJV translation. It is now almost universally recognized that the Textus Receptus contains so many significant departures from the original manuscripts of the various New Testament books that it cannot be relied on as a basis for translation into other languages. How can the NIV translators make such a claim when they have never seen the original manuscripts? On page 53 we read, What Greek text was used by the translators of the NIV New Testament? It was basically that found in the United Bible Societies and Nestle's printed Greek New Testaments, which contained the latest and best Greek text available. On page 55, the NIV translators admit to their use of the same two corrupt Roman Catholic manuscripts that were used by Westcott and Hort. They go on to say, This provides us with a more accurate Greek text of the New Testament than that found in the Textus Receptus. Let's take a look at some facts about these two manuscripts that the NIV translators don't want their readers to know about. Codex B, also known as the Vaticanus Manuscript, omits the following portions of scripture. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 through chapter 46 verse 28, Psalms 106 through 138, Matthew chapter 16 verses 2 and 3, the pastoral epistles, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 through chapter 13 verse 25, and the entire book of Revelation. In 1844, Constantine von Tischendorf discovered the first pages of what would later become known as the Sinaiticus Manuscript. And where were these ancient pages of scripture? He found them in a pile of waste paper used to start fires at the monastery. But was there a reason that this ancient codex was destined for the fireplace? A few years after the discovery of the Sinaiticus Manuscript, a man named Dr. Prebendary Scrivener was able to examine the document. This is what he wrote. The codex is covered with such alterations, i.e. alterations of an obviously correctional character, brought in by at least ten different revisers, some of them systematically spread over every page, others occasional or limited to separate portions of the manuscript, many of these being contemporaneous with the first writer, but for the greater part belonging to the sixth or seventh century. Another man named Dean John William Bergen was also able to examine the Sinaiticus manuscript. This is what he wrote. On many occasions, 10, 20, 30, 40 words are dropped through very carelessness. Letters and words, even whole sentences, are frequently written twice over or begun and immediately canceled. While that gross blunder whereby a clause is omitted because it happens to end in the same words as the clause preceding, occurs no less than 115 times in the New Testament. A man named Herman Hoskier would compare the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus manuscripts and would reveal that these two codices actually contradicted each other over 3,000 times in the Gospels alone. He would write, I have tabulated the major part of these differences between Aleph and B in the Gospels and given the supporting authorities on each side. They amount to Matthew 656, Mark 567, Luke 791, John 1022 for a total of 3036. If you look at a Catholic Bible, you will see that they include other books as part of the inspired Old Testament text. Books like Tobit, Judith, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, as well as Wisdom, Sirach, and Baruch. But where do these books come from? The truth is that the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus manuscripts both contain these apocryphal books as part of the inspired text. If versions like the New American Standard Bible and the NIV claim to be the most accurate translations of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, then why don't they include the apocryphal books? 
A few years ago, the New Revised Standard Version did release an edition that contained the Apocrypha. This, of course, shouldn't be much of a surprise, seeing as how the New Revised Standard Version also has many Catholic editions available. On page 1160 of this Catholic Youth Bible we read, So the next time you respond Amen at a Eucharistic celebration, know that you are saying yes to a special and life-giving relationship with God. This blasphemous Catholic practice of the Eucharist teaches that a priest has the power to transform a round wafer into the flesh of Jesus Christ. The faithful Catholic must then eat Jesus and drink his blood in the form of wine. The elements of bread and wine are not to be taken as symbolic, but rather as the literal flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. This is how a Catholic receives Christ. This mystical process of changing ordinary bread and wine into Jesus Christ is called transubstantiation. For many centuries, thousands of faithful Christian martyrs were executed by the Roman Catholic Church because they rejected the pagan sacrifice of the Eucharist. But today we have supposedly Protestant Bibles like the New Revised Standard Version teaching this Catholic heresy that resulted in thousands of Christians being burned alive. It is also interesting to note that in 1988 Rupert Murdoch purchased the New Revised Standard Version. He also owns and prints the NIV and the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey. Just ten years later, the Pope knighted Rupert Murdoch into the Order of St. Gregory the Great. Is this a coincidence? We spoke earlier of the fact that the NIV translators rejected the Textus Receptus and used the Nestle's text instead. So what is the story behind the Nestle's text? In 1898, a man named Eberhard Nessel would combine the Greek texts of Westcott and Hort, Tischendorf, and Richard Francis Weymouth. Over the next 100 years, this Nessel's text would go through various editions and is known today as the Nessel Alan 27th edition. Now let's take a look at some of the men and women who have been involved in producing this Greek text. In 1952, a German named Kurt Alan would join the Nessel's team. He would assist in producing new editions of the Nessel's Greek text his final being the 25th edition. He would eventually be joined by his wife, Barbara. I believe this photo shows who Kurt Aland was really serving. Now let's look at another man who was involved with the Nestle's text. His name is Bruce Metzger. Bruce Metzger was a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary. He was also one of the creators of the New Revised Standard Version. At his death in 2007, Princeton Theological Seminary would write, In 1993, Bruce Metzger presented a copy of the New Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition to Pope John Paul II at the Vatican. Bruce Metzger understood and was passionate about the significance of biblical translation for ecumenical dialogue. This article goes on to say, in 1972 he chaired the subcommittee that translated 3rd and 4th Maccabees and Psalm 151 for an expanded version of the Apocrypha. He personally presented this expanded version to His All Holiness Demetrius I in 1976. It was important to him that Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, and Protestant Christians be able to have recourse to a common biblical text as an instrument of unity. 
Here we see Demetrius I listed with Catholic priests. It is no secret that the Orthodox Church has been working with Roman Catholicism for a very long time. In this article, Archbishop Demetrius is said to be teaching at a Roman Catholic Jesuit University. Here we see the current Greek Orthodox Patriarch, Bartholomew I, meeting with Nancy Pelosi. In this article we can see what he is working to accomplish. His All Holiness has worked tirelessly for reconciliation among Christian churches and acquired an international reputation for raising environmental awareness throughout the world. He has worked to advance reconciliation with the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Communion as well as other confessions through theological dialogues and personal encounters with respective leaders in order to address issues of common concern. Why would a supposed Christian like Bruce Metzger work with and for these enemies of Jesus Christ? Now let's take a look at another member of the Nestle's team. His name is Carlo Maria Martini and he is a Jesuit priest. In April of 2005 the BBC ran this article where they claimed that if elected Cardinal Martini would be the first Jesuit to become Pope. However, a few weeks later Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger was chosen as the next Pope instead of Martini. On page 45 of the Nestle's 27th edition we read, The text shared by these two editions was adopted internationally by Bible societies and following an agreement between the Vatican and the United Bible Societies it has served as the basis for new translations and for revisions made under their supervision. This marks a significant step with regard to interconfessional relationships. It should naturally be understood that this text is a working text in the sense of a century-long Nestle tradition. It is not to be considered as definitive, but as a stimulus to further efforts towards defining and verifying the text of the New Testament. For many reasons, however, the present edition has not been deemed an appropriate occasion for introducing textual changes. One can only be left to wonder what the Jesuit Cardinal Carlo Martini has planned for the next edition of the Nestle's text. Next we'll take a look at this Jehovah's Witness Greek interlinear New Testament. On pages 8 through 9 we read about what text is used by the Jehovah's Witnesses to produce their corrupt New World Translation. The Greek text that we have used as the basis for the New World Translation accepted Westcott and Hort text 1881 by reason of its acknowledged excellence but we have also taken into consideration other texts including those prepared by D. Eberhard Nessel, the Spanish Jesuit scholar Jose Maria Bover and another Jesuit scholar A. Merck, the UBS text of 1975 and the Nessel Alan text of 1979 were consulted to update the critical apparatus of this edition. The preface of this Catholic New American Bible shows that they also use the Nestle's text as the basis for their translation. It is important for you, the viewer, to realize that if you have a Bible version produced since 1881, then it can be traced back to this corrupt Nestle's Greek text. The Jesuit plan to destroy the Protestant Reformation is no longer being carried out in secret. Today the signs of Catholic infiltration are everywhere. 
Why would the Catholic News Agency report on the release of the newest NIV when the Council of Trent supposedly condemned the writings of Protestants? Maybe it is because Catholic websites openly promote and recommend the NIV. Here on AmericanCatholic.org, Catholics are warned about the King James Version being woefully outdated. But the NIV is praised and is said to be an ecumenical translation. It is also interesting to note that the new revision of the NIV is to be completed in 2010 on the 400th anniversary of the Jesuit Dewey Reims Bible. But it isn't just Catholic websites promoting new versions like the NIV. Supposedly Protestant bookstores like ChristianBook.com are now selling Roman Catholic books and Bibles. Simply typing in the word Catholic in the search area netted 5,098 results. Here we see a book for Catholic girls that contains verses from the NIV. Or how about a book on the rosary? ChristianBook.com also sells the Catholic Catechism. Here on Berean Christian Store's website, you can see that they sell 2,483 Catholic-related items. Books like Born Fundamentalist, Born Again Catholic, or how about a book on the Holy Eucharist? Here we see another supposedly Protestant website selling Roman Catholic literature. It is interesting to note that these three websites will not sell most of the books and materials that are available today which defend the King James Version. One can only be left to wonder who really runs these websites. Representing the presiding Bishop Mark Hansen of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Holding this, may I present Bishop Jeremiah J. Park, Bishop of the New York Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. Holiness, may I present Reverend Wesley Granberg Michelson, the General Secretary of the Reformed Church in America. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. Clifton Kirkpatrick, the stated clerk of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in the United States. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. William J. Shaw, President of the National Baptist Convention, United States. Your Holiness, may I present Bishop James Leggett, General Superintendent of the International Pentecost Holiness Church. Your Holiness, may I present Dr. Leith Anderson, President of the National Association of Evangelicals. Your Holiness, may I present Bishop David H. Benke, President of the Atlantic District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod.
The leaders of the emergent church movement are now calling for the end of the Protestant Reformation. Here, Brian McLaren openly confesses that he is a post-Protestant, Catholic, unfinished Christian. In 2003, Tony Jones released this book on youth ministry. He openly recommends many Roman Catholic practices, the most shocking of all being an entire chapter on Ignatius Loyola and the Jesuits. On page 233, he recommends the occult New Age practice of walking a labyrinth. He then goes on to boldly recommend the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. These mind control techniques have been used by Jesuits for hundreds of years. On page 103, Tony Jones suggests forming a 30-day Ignatian summer camp. It is also interesting to note that both McLaren and Jones have their books published by Zondervan, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, as we discussed earlier. Please notice the interesting symbol on this emerging church website. Does it look familiar? Clicking on this link will take you to their bookstore where you can buy a book about the Roman Catholic Mass or perhaps a book on Catholic evangelism. Another spokesman for the emerging church is a woman named Phyllis Tickle. On pages 46 through 47 of her book she writes, Now some 500 years later, even many of the most die-hard Protestants among us have grown suspicious of scripture and scripture only. We question what the words mean, literally, metaphorically, actually, we even question which words do and do not belong in scripture and the purity of the editorial line of descent of those that do. We begin to refer to Luther's principle of sola scriptura, scriptura sola, as having been little more than the creation of a paper pope in place of a flesh and blood one. And even as we speak, the authority that has been in place for 500 years withers away in our hands. Where now is the authority circles overhead like a dark angel goading us toward this establishment? Where indeed? On page 58 she discusses the Counter-Reformation and claims that the five councils of Trent were godly assemblies of churchmen trying to purify both doctrine and practice. On pages 150 through 151 she writes, the new Christianity of the Great Emergence must discover some authority base or delivery system and or governing agency of its own. It must formulate, and soon, something other than Luther's Sola Scriptura, which, although used so well by the Great Reformation originally, is now seen as hopelessly outmoded or insufficient, even after it is, as here, spruced up and recouched in more current sensibilities. Now that the King James Bible has been removed from the hands of the majority of professing Christians, Satan's false prophets are able to deceive them into thinking that the Roman Catholic Church is no longer the enemy of Bible-believing Christianity. Loyola's Jesuits are bringing in a new Dark Age. For 500 years, the basis of authority has been Sola Scriptura, Scriptura Sola, and it's not anymore. And when you say that to folk, it's very threatening. It's very, very threatening. So number one, we need to know why it's threatening and to be appreciative of the fact that it is threatening. And then number two, we need to look at what were the limitations of it the minute it was formulated as a doctrine. And number three, where now is our authority? Uh, the minute you say that's not going to be 
the whole authority that. Then you open up the question, so where is our authority? There is always one overarching question. That question is, where is the authority? Because we don't know. We've lost our authority. You and I now live in a globalized society. Who's got the authority? One of the things that's happening in this great emergence is that the division between Roman Catholic believers and non-Roman Catholic believers is dwindling away as they enter into the emergence. It's not just a matter of coming and sitting in a pew and enduring 50 or 70 or whatever minutes of, uh, of observing something happen. But it, it's, it's saying, I want to experience God. I'm interested in, in coming into an experience here. Worship is participatory and multisensory. People are encouraged to tangibly express their spirituality. Many are weaving together elements from different religious traditions, especially Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Some are discovering medieval mystical practices, such as walking the labyrinth, but adding decidedly modern twists. It's a pick-your-own-mix approach that also stresses community and social justice. More and more of us are feeling that if we have a version of the Christian faith that does not make us the kind of people that make this a better world, we really want no part of it. There are similar practices in mainline Protestant churches, such as Cornerstone United Methodist Church in Naples, Florida. There, a blue jeans wearing, electric guitar playing minister leads a lively service that combines United Methodist tradition with high church liturgy and a Pentecostal flavor. I joke around in in saying that I'm more of a Methacathacostalite than I am a United Methodist. And, and I think that's because each of those traditions has added so much to my faith experience in my group. Uh, the Jesuits, uh, who have so informed the educational life of this country, were started as part of the Counter-Reformation. It was the response of Catholicism to the Protestant push in the same way Protestantism today is going to respond, part of it, a part of this 30%, is going to respond to the pressure of the emergence. I said every period of upheaval, every time we do a 500-year rummage sale, we, we have a, a central question, where now is the authority? The authority for the Reformation was sola scriptura and scriptura only. Scripture only and only scripture. No more Pope, no more magisterium, only the scripture. That authority won't work now. Not that scripture isn't the authority, but that the absolutism which, with which Protestant established it as the authority has now shattered and gone. You'd save a lot more souls if you could get rid of doctrine, and that's the truth, you know. Reel them in and then tell them the price of eating. Your kingdom is in your hands and in your shaping. Go forth and bring forth a new form of Christianity that will serve a new culture. And may God bless you. After watching this video, you might be asking yourself why the Roman Catholic Church wants so badly to get rid of the King James Version. The answer is simple. The King James Version is and always has been the greatest threat to Roman Catholicism. Why? Because it is the only Bible in common use today which can be traced back to the true Christians in Antioch. The King James Version has also produced more spiritual fruit than all other Bibles combined. And the King James Version's Textus Receptus is backed up by over 95% of all ancient Greek manuscripts. But there is another even greater reason for Catholicism's hatred of the King James Version. Revelation 17 describes an evil religious city which is guilty of shedding the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus Christ. There can be only one city on this earth that matches the description of Revelation 17. 
Revelation 18 goes on to describe the coming destruction of this wicked religious city. For this cause, the Roman Catholic Church has fought relentlessly to replace the King James Version. They know that their days are numbered and they want to kill the faith of as many believers as they can. Rome can never destroy God's holy word, the King James Bible. All they can do is try to counterfeit it and turn you against the pure word of God in English. The only question that remains is, which Bible will you choose?